Hi, everybody. Welcome to <laughs> Digital Inclusion 101 in this special week. Um, actually, Miles, I'm going to ask you to just to stop screen sharing just for a minute so we get to see everybody's beautiful faces. And hi. Welcome. For, thank you for joining us today. This is awesome. Wow, so many new faces. Hi, guys. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so this is Digital Inclusion 101, and it is our, um, well, now it's not monthly uh, webinar, but it's our special webinar that we get to introduce Digital Inclusion, the field of Digital Inclusion to our ever-growing community um, around the country. So thank you for, for joining us. And this is a special edition. So Miles, if you wanna go ahead and share this slide there. This is a special edition of uh, our Digital Inclusion Week. Um, uh, for introducing digital inclusion, <laughs> sorry, one on one, got it. And um, before we get started, please go ahead, use the chat and start to introduce yourselves. Yes, thank you guys. So next slide. So digital inclusion week is happening right now and I hope you guys have been able to participate in some of the events that we have posted online. So this is our annual um, campaign to recognize and empower local organizations and local community that's doing digital inclusion work. And uh, it, it's really our favorite week of the year. Maybe maybe not inclusion is, is, is our, our second favorite, but uh, this is awesome. Oh, I'm looking at the chat. So a lot of people from, Everywhere, California, Seattle, New York. Hi, it's awesome. So to get us started, I want just to give a quick overview of what we're gonna be covering today. So the Digital Inclusion 101, again, is just an introduction. So we're gonna share a lot of information and a lot of um, you know, definitions and topics for you guys to use in your community. And you can always reach out to us after the, the webinar to get more information, to get in-depth um, resources. And, and if you have any questions, we will have questions at the end of the, the webinar. So I'm sorry, we're gonna have time for questions. So if you hold on your questions, you can wait until the end and unmute and you know, ask your question, or you can put in the chat and some of my colleagues is gonna start um, uh, help start posting and, and answer some of your questions. So for today, the, we are gonna call some introductions to digital inclusion, some of the basic definition uh, of terminology within digital inclusion. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the data and research that's out there that can help you guys on the ground um, and uh, some other tools for assessment and looking at government efforts around the country. Um, and then we're gonna break down some of the um, areas for digital inclusion work and provide you guys with lots of resources. So a lot of, a lot of resources and a lot of links is gonna be embedded in the presentation and, and then also posted on the chat. And then we are, we wanna take some time to talk about what's going on in policy and some of the opportunities that's happening nationally. So to do that, um, I want to make sure you guys meet my colleagues here at NDIA, so next slide. So this is my awesome team and they are here to, to make sure we, we get to cover all this awesome content and, and, and there's a lot of resources and they're really an expert in, in those areas. So I'm gonna let them say hi. Um, Amy, you wanna go ahead and say, introduce yourself real quick and say one thing you like to do for fun and your free time. Hi friends, it's so exciting to see so many of you here. I'm Amy Huffman, I'm the policy director. I'm based in Durham, North Carolina, and I like to play guitar in my spare time. Well, learn to play guitar in my spare time. Paula, you wanna go next? Yeah, hey everyone, uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, my name is Paula Balboa. Uh, I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, but this week I'm visiting family in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I really like to explore regional foods. And yesterday I learned that in Michigan, they have a thing here called the Olive Burger, which I tried for the first time. So, very exciting for me. <laughs> nice to be here. Miles? 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miles Miller. I am the program associate at NDIA. Um, I'm based in Phoenix, Arizona, and for fun, I like all things outdoors, backpacking, hiking, camping, so I'm definitely in the right state for that. Thank you. Awesome. And um, my name is Muni Rejester, and I am currently in San Antonio, Texas. And the thing is I like to do for fun. It's some, sometimes something calming, like just paddle boarding, it's one of my all-time favorite, and there's a lot of reverse in around Texas and around San Antonio. So I've been enjoying that part a bit. I'm still 90, 80 degrees over here. So I still get to do that a lot. So to get ours, us kicked, kicked off, I want to have our awesome director CEO at NDIA to join us. So Angela, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us more about NDIA? Hi everyone, I'm Angela Seifer. I'm the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. I live in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I'm thrilled to have all of you with us during Digital Inclusion Week. This week has definitely uh, had us running pretty full speed and I suspect that's true for you also. Uh, so quick overview about NDIA for those of you who are new to our community. We are a unified voice for home and public broadband, personal devices and local technology training and support programs. Uh, so we represent you. Right, so we are your voice uh, nationally and with the federal government uh, because and we, and we got started because there wasn't an entity doing that. So seven years ago, there was a group of us who was like, hey, we know federal policy is being made and nobody's there saying this is what's going on on the ground and really digital inclusion work happens locally. It happens in the communities. And so we've filled that gap, essentially. We're a place for the peer to peer learning like is going to happen today. It's not just coming from NDIA staff. We just get the conversation started and everything that we're going to say to you, we learn from folks on the ground, right? Like that's where the expertise is. We hear what's what's happening and we package it as well as we can to share with folks who are new to our field, as some of you are. Miles. Thanks. Uh, so then we divide up our work into practitioner support, policy awareness, data research. And what this means is the practitioner support is that peer-to-peer -peer networking. We want you to talk to each other because, again, you are the experts. Uh, but then also we hear what you're saying and we uh, document it. We have lots and lots and lots of resources on the website, which some of which you'll hear about today. We take what we learn to influence try to influence the public policy and awareness of the issue. Um, so that awareness comes in all, all the webinars and media interviews that we do. Uh, but then also, as we're hearing what's happening from the digital inclusion programs on the ground, we are also looking at the data that's out there and then trying to mesh up in our heads how that works between the data that's out there and what we're hearing from you. And that's how we got to things like realizing digital redlining was happening in Cleveland, which sent off, sent off you know, lots of folks understanding digital redlining was happening in their communities. So digital inclusion, what is digital inclusion? One of the first things that we did, we were like, okay, we're not using the term digital inclusion and digital equity the same. Some of us, in fact, I would do it too. Uh, I would use them interchangeably in one paragraph, but I had no idea what the difference between them was. So a group of folks, and there was a lot of disagreement, I uh, wanna make sure you know, that we finally got to agreement of where, what those words could mean. So digital equity is the goal. This is where we want everybody to be individuals and communities having full full participation in um, everything, basically. Right. So then when we say digital inclusion, we're saying this is how you get to that digital equity. These are the activities that lead to digital equity. And you all know that is the affordable home broadband, the appropriate device, the digital literacy training, the tech support, the content. And we know that you need some guidance. The folks on the ground need guidance on how to get everyone there. Digital redlining, just real quick, this is a newer definition that we added to our list of definitions and there is a link on our, there's a page that we have on our website just for definitions, because we think this definitions piece is so important for everybody to be using the same terms. Digital redlining is discrimination by the ISPs, ISPs are internet service providers, and deployment, maintenance, upgrade and delivery of their services. So really what we're getting at is that in the lower income communities, what we tend to see is there are areas where they don't receive the newer technologies, the upgrades, they don't receive the service that a higher income neighborhood gets. And we wanna make sure that folks understand 
this is because internet service in the United States is, is a commodity. It's a commercial service. They have no reason to have to serve everybody equitably, right? Other than, you know, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> but that's why we all exist, right? Is that we need to fix that. We have to figure out how to get there, which is policy changes, which is act activity and solutions at the local level. Uh, so yeah, so we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you, Angela. What I think one last piece that I'm supposed to cover is the digital inclusion ecosystem. This is something we've more recently been kicking around inside the NDIA community, is the idea that whoever's providing access to computers and whoever's providing the digital literacy training and whoever's providing the, um, the, the helping folks sign up for discounted or free internet, that there has to be a means of them all talking to each other and strengthen each other and knowing what's happening, right? That's the whole ecosystem kind of thing. One leads the next, leads the next, comes back around. That us understanding what that ecosystem looks like and us understanding how to strengthen it is what's going to help all of us to have greater impact in this field. So we are on an, an early journey of understanding what a strong digital, in, digital inclusion ecosystem looks like. But I encourage you all, as you are on this journey with us, to be thinking about what that means and how to structure that in your communities. OK, I think that was my last one. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Angela, again. Um, so friends, um, we are going to start in this amazing quick marathon of going through those big areas of digital inclusion. And, I, and keep in mind that a lot of the resources and things we're gonna be putting here, it's really for you to use it and, um, and, and, and you get to pick and choose what you want to focus on. But this is just a quick introduction of those areas. So to get us started, um, going a little bit deeper on the topic of digital inclusion. So Paolo, I'll turn it to you to talk about data and research. Great, thanks Muni Ray. Um, yeah, so like, like Angela was saying, we get a lot, a lot of our knowledge comes from talking with practitioners on the ground who are doing this sort of work. That's sort of what frames what we look for when we look when we try to define uh, the gaps in digital equity locally. So we use research and data to determine the barriers to digital equity. We, we like to look at who does have um, broadband availability, but the question is who doesn't adopt? So for instance, just because there are wires in the ground underneath an apartment building or a house, the bigger question is, is that how, does that household have a home broadband connection? If not, why not? The question usually, the answer usually comes down to an issue of cost. Another area of, uh, another barrier to digital equity is also the issue of appropriate devices. What kind of device is a household using to connect to the internet? Are they relying on a smartphone? Are they relying on a tablet? We know that that might not be appropriate for uh, you know, attaching, an e attaching something to an email or filling out a job application. It's just not the right sort of device to use that. Another barrier is digital skills. So what if uh, a community member doesn't know how to use the device to access the plethora of resources that are available to them on the internet? These are the three barriers of uh, adopt the three barriers of uh, digital equity here. So we use research and data to really define and pin down those problem areas. We use a, a variety of data sources. Uh, we have friends at the Pew Research Center who release an internet fact sheet every year that we find very, very uh, useful and interesting to frame the issue of digital inequity uh, and how it's broken down across different demographics. From the Pew Research Center, we know that the demographics of who is connected and who is not connected trend towards inequity. So if you break it down by income, education, and race, we, the Pew has, Pew's research has shown that those that have the highest rates of digital exclusion are lower income, meaning that these are households that make less than $30,000. They also tend not to have completed high school and in the race category, they also tend to become, to, to be black and Latino families. So the same barriers to access uh, for other, uh, for civic participation is also broken down by broadband adoption. As far as digital skills go, we have other great friends at a organization called the National Skills Coalition. They look at how digital skills or digital literacy um, and research into how those, uh, the intersection of digital skills and digital literacy and how those impact uh, workforce. So 
they have researched and described how digital skills and participation in the workforce um, have the same trends towards, towards inequity across education, across race, um, and across class as well. So from a, a report that they released last year, they showed that um, they, they looked at race in the workforce and they showed that black workers comprise 12% of all workers in the, in the American workforce, but represent 15% of those with no digital skills, 21% of those with limited digital skills. We also do our own research. So last summer, we wrote and published a white paper called Limiting Broadband called Limiting Broadband Investment to Rural Only Discriminates Against Black Americans and Other Communities of Color. The link to that will be in the chat here in a second. In it, we highlighted that the excessive focus on broadband deployment into rural areas and the lack of deployment into rural, into urban and suburban communities. We used data from the American Community Survey, which is one of our favorite data sources. We also used data from the FCC's Form 77. NDIA maintains a research and data page with information about specific tables um, where you can find and access this information. But I just wanted to use this time to highlight some of the issues that NDIA has uh, brought to light in the past few years. So I'll send it over to my coworker, Miles. Thank you, Paulo. Um, if the slides are looking a little crazy, it's because um, I'm trying to juggle slides with speaking with uh, <laughs> making sure everything's in the right order. Um, so moving on to the assessment of government digital inclusion activities, um, one of the projects that NDIA is engaged in is what we call the digital inclusion trailblazers. Um, and what this is, is a look at local governments that are um, going above and beyond with regards to engaging their communities in, in digital inclusion activities, um, as well as kind of setting the standard for what good digital inclusion practices look like, moving their uh, communities um, and regions towards digital equity. Um, so what Digital Inclusion Trailblazers is, is essentially a, uh, it's a Google Fiber, uh, Google Fiber sponsored um, on a roll call of all the local governments across the country um, that have been recognized by NDIA as doing fantastic work um, within the scope of digital inclusion. Um, and how we do this is we determine trailblazing status, whether or not a city is recognized um, across six indicators. Um, these indicators include things like the presence of um, coalitions, uh, funding for positions of digital inclusion within local governments, um, the presence of a strategic plan um, by a local government, um, I won't go through all of the indicators now, but they are present on our Trailblazers page, uh, the link which will be um, added to the chat. Um, and so why? Why do we do this? Um, I mean, apart from um, the, the fact that it's important to recognize good work, um, there are an additional, uh, I guess, two um, additional reasons for this project, um, at least two main ones. Uh, the first is, you know, uh, bragging rights uh, leads to good, um, good fundraising opportunities. If you're able to uh, go to a potential donor and say, hey, look, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance has recognized us as like, um, you know, being at the forefront of uh, strategies um, with regards to digital inclusion practices, we've been recognized. Um, it looks good. It looks really good when you're trying to get a bit of money. Um, but more so than that, it provides a template for other local governments who wish to be um, engaging in digital inclusion practices to imitate what you're doing, to use you as a guide, best practices of sorts. Um, so if another local government saying, hey, we want to develop a strategic plan for digital inclusion, we don't know how, we don't know, you know where we could find these resources, uh, we don't know what should go in it. Well, here are almost uh, 17 uh, trailblazing cities that can be used as um, you know, a cache of knowledge of sorts. Um, we can imitate, we can pull what we need from them. Um, with regards to using this uh, resource, um, as you can see on the screen, there's an arrow that points to the little, uh, what was a plus sign is now a minus sign. Um, that is to access the drop down menu uh, for each trailblazing city, which will allow for the information attached to each trailblazing city to become visible as hyperlinks. So if I wanted to uh, say, view the city and county of San Francisco's performance plan, 
I would click on that drop down menu, open up the hyperlinks and click on performance plan. Same with strategic plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then of course the check marks in each of the boxes indicate what documentation is available for each trailblazing city. Um, if that is the um, local version of um, digital inclusion, digital equity work um, and local governments, um, then this is the state version, uh, the digital equity scorecard. This has a look, it's a similar setup, um, but it has a look at uh, digital equity practices um, on a state level um, across the country. Um, the link, of course, again, will be added to the chat. Um, so it's a similar setup to Trailblazers um, in that um, this looks at what states are doing um, with regards to moving towards digital equity. Um, this project is a relatively recent addition to uh, the NDIA page. Um, it's our first public iteration of it, so there will definitely be um, additions as we move forward. So keep an eye out on this map. Um, fantastic thing about this map is that um, in the same way we have the criteria that uh, we use in Trailblazers um, to determine state score. However, with this map, we can decide whether or not or you can decide whether or not you'd want to be able to um, view this by uh, the criteria or by state. So getting to the homepage, you'll be asked whether or not you want to search for information using the criteria um, or the state. And um, hovering over each of these states will also give you the score out of a possible six points. So as you can see on my screen, um, Arizona is not doing too, too well, 2.7 out of six. Um, using the drop down menu similar to trailblazers i can see what is present and what is not present for that criteria um, however if we go on to say louisiana we can see that uh, both uh, criterion for data on digital skills is met and they've got a 4.7 out of six um, and then if you click on the read more button um, under the drop down menus for criteria it'll give you additional information um, on what Louisiana has with regards to data and digital skills needs. Um, these include hyperlinks um, to that information. So it's really a fantastic resource. Um, we greatly encourage you to go and check that out. Um, as I said, both uh, links will be placed in the chat. And if you have any questions with regards to either of these projects, um, I will put my email address in the chat as well. Awesome. Thank you, Miles. So friends, um, this we spend a you know first half of this webinar really defining making sure that we speak the same language in this you know world of digital inclusion and and sharing some resources and data to to not only the to help you on the ground determine the baseline for uh digital inclusion in your community and the the low uh, not, not only data nationally but also ranking cities and states um, and where they are in their digital inclusion efforts. So this is some of the resources and some of the work that NDIA does to help uh, you guys on the ground that are engaged or want to become more engaged in providing digital inclusion services and advocacy. So right now, can so we are, I wanted to just, um, I see, um, I want to just take all of that information, talk about what does, digital inclusion work looks like on the ground. And some of you may be interested just in doing advocacy or doing assessments. And some of you are really interested, like, hey, how can I spend digital literacy training in my community? Um, so, or how can I make sure people have access to a photo of a device and, 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 and internet? So this is the session. We're gonna go into the weeds a little bit of what digital inclusion work looks like. So we're gonna talk about those three areas of digital inclusion work. Um, and next slide. And before I do that, I want to make sure we think about digital inclusion work as being a way to connect. Really think of, not think about the work and digital inclusion connecting to other areas and maybe all the focus is um, throughout your community, but the focus of your organization. And that really helps when you do that kind of like model, you know, tracing really helps, you know. Uh, communicate, but also engage and, and, and get support and funds for your, pro your program. Um, when you say, hey, clearly invest in this, we can achieve this impact. And we, we can work together because 
I, you know, you might be focusing on digital literacy and then you're working with an organization that really focus on workforce development. So kind of creating that pathway to connect the work to the impact is really critical uh, um, when we move forward into digital inclusion work. Um, next slide. So to get us started, one, resources, one resource that NDIA has, um, has on our website, um, it's among many, and we'll share this slide with you guys again, and there's a lot of links already attached here, but um, is the startup manual. So if you want to get digital inclusion work started in your community or expand it, um, that I really invite you guys to check out this resource. Um, so the startup manual is really, um, it's a guidance and resource manual for um, implementing digital inclusion work. So it goes from, and you see there um, some of the chapters, you know, starting a digital inclusion program, um, getting um, digital literacy training, what are some of the resources there? So we actually, NDIA has listed some of those free curriculum and resources and tell you uh, if you need to pay for it. Actually, all of them are free resources um, that's already um, available. So you can you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can you can use the resources that's out already there and maybe you know use a bunch of resources. Um, I guess getting curriculum from a bunch of different organizations and resources and building your own. But you don't you're not alone. There's a lot of work that has been done. So really our job is to to share and make sure that you guys have access to that um, resource. And um, so we'll you'll find Again, things from how to get affordable devices and in, in, in your community and digital literacy and, and, and what are some of the uh, affordable internet options out there. Um, and again, this tool was built hearing from what's going on in the country and, um, and, and really working with um, people on the ground and, and get in building this tool. Next slide. Great. Um, so going a little bit deeper and 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 to one area right it's, it's it's and i like to say connecting people is like one of the hardest part of digital inclusion work um and 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 it's really hard to navigate and provide that resource to your community so ndia we have a website uh, for free low cost plans and in that in that website you will find a list of current um internet service provider um, offers for low uh, low income families. And, um, and then again, I think it's important, like this is a great resource and will tell you how, it, what are some of the criteria for people to qualify to access the services. It's kind of all categorized there. So it's really easy for you to get that information and then transform that and provide a better service and, and work in, on digital inclusion efforts in your community. Um, it's important to mention that these tools and it's not for us to um, send to a family that's trying to find internet, right? It's really for the practitioners. It's really for you guys, for, for us that are working on the ground and helping people get connected. So it's, it's not to the end user, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a connection. It's, con it's a connection of your services to, to the community. Um, so one, other program that um, NDIA has been building and learning from with the community, it's the Digital Navigator program. It's our awesome, most favorite program. And like, I feel like everywhere I go, everybody's talking about Digital Navigator. So if you're not familiar with it, you know, there's a link on the chat. So the Digital Navigator, what I love the most about the Digital Navigator program is that it's a, it's a replicable model that you can pick up and then implement in your community. And the, the whole premise is around the program. It's bringing that human element into digital inclusion work. It, because sometimes I feel communities think, oh, digital inclusion and technology, it's, it's very cold and it's very you know, techy and, and, not, and, and can be very uh, disorienting and lonely, quite frankly, for somebody that's on the uh, excluded from digital in, um, digital resources to tap into that. So Digital Navigator really looks looks to provide uh, the human touch and help people throughout the process of getting a computer and accessing uh, affordable internet options or, or 
uh, developing, further developing the digital uh, literacy skills. So it's 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 a model and it's it's there and and it goes through the model goes through data, you know, developing a program and gathering data and measuring success. So it's a very thought out um, program and I really in, encourage you guys to check it out. And the last um, topic that we will cover on the work of digital inclusion in communities is, is coalitions, coalition building. So throughout the, throughout the pandemic now, I think we've more than since, since the last seven years, I think more than double uh, our number of digital inclusion coalitions around the country. And coalitions are organization of organizations that come together to provide, um, provide um, advocacy to their community, but also to coordinate services to, so that they can provide a more comprehensive uh, digital inclusion intervention in their community. So there are a couple of things you should know about digital inclusion uh, coalitions is that they, uh, they're really meant to foster coordination and collaboration. Coalitions tend to um, make sure that inclusive and, and equity is at the forefront. And then that means engaging different organizations throughout the community that serve different parts of digital inclusion work. Um, and coalitions operate in the public realm, and then leadership and uh, in structure really are inclusive and participatory. Um, some areas that we, um, we have identified that coalitions have been engaging on mostly is really education and advocacy and um, providing um, extra resource and development to organizations um, in the community that it's doing digital inclusion work or want to expand their, their efforts, uh, strategic program alignment and um, assessment and resources. Um, a lot of digital inclusion coalitions around the country right now, I think we have place-based coalition, we have 34 um, coalitions throughout the country that, um, and a lot of them are engaging and either in supporting or actually being in the forefront and trying to create a digital equity plan. So, so those are some of the areas that digital inclusion coalitions are active um, throughout the community, but most important coalitions is just bringing people together that care and helping uh, create a platform for connection at work and, and, and innovation in the work. So we have currently on the website, we have a digital coalition guidebook and you will work we're going to be updating the guidebook soon, but you have the website there. Um, so to get us through our next exciting topic, it's, it's Amy. So let's go ahead and cover some of what's going on in policy and some opportunities and you know advocacy. Thank you. Thanks, Minnie Ray. Um, well, hello again, everyone. Um, I know we're about 36 minutes in and you've been throwing a lot of information. I'm about to throw you more information, but I've got good news for you. Um, after almost a decade of working in this field and seeing hardly any funding for this work, um, if any, uh, there's now funding, yay! Uh, the challenge is that it's um, in a lot of different places and through a lot of different funds and um, it's a, it's a little bit tricky. So I'm gonna go over um, some of the big ones that came out of COVID um, and the federal government's response to COVID and was creating some of these funds and programs. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about future possibilities um, that might come should the infrastructure bill pass. I'm not gonna get into what states and local governments are doing and how they're using these funds or um, how they might be launching their own initiatives, but do just know that many states and local governments in response to COVID have stepped up and created their own programs to address the digital divide. And so uh, if you're not already connected with your state or local government, I would encourage you to do that and to find out what they're doing to support closing the digital divide and how you can help. So the first fund to talk about today is the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. This was allocated from Congress and it's a $3.2 billion fund um, and it sits at the Federal Communications Commission. 
um, which is a federal agency. And this fund is specifically to address um, one of the challenges that Paula brought up earlier, which is the unaffordability, inaffordability, however you say that word, the fact that internet is too expensive. And this, and this fund provides a $50 a month subsidy for households who qualify for the program. Um, one note about this program, it, it is temporary. Emergency is in the name for a reason. Um, once the funds run out, the program ends. However, should the infrastructure bill pass, there is funds in there to continue the program and modify it and extend it. And so we are hopeful that that will happen. We have a lot of resources on our website about EBB, um, which is the acronym we call it these days. And um, there's lots of information on the FCC and USAC's page that we encourage you to look at. Um, but I just, one thing to flag is if you are working with any families who might qualify, which are families that are 135% of the poverty line or on free and reduced lunch or um, SNAP or Medicaid or all sorts of things like that, that I would encourage you to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the program and support them in signing up while the benefit is available to them because it could really support them in getting access to the internet. The next program is if you are working at a library or school, you'd be interested in this. It's called the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Again, allocated by Congress, $7.2 billion, and it is housed at the FCC again. Um, this can provide funding to schools and libraries for connectivity, so hotspots or even sometimes um, bulk purchases of wireline internet. So say there's Comcast, they could purchase 20 subscriptions and then um, give those out to families. It also provides funding for devices. In the American Rescue Plan Act um, that was passed, I believe it was 2020, um, ha there are two funds in there that can go towards digital inclusion and, and broadband expansion as well. Um, there's $350 billion in the state and local government funds. Digital inclusion and broadband were eligible expenses within those funds amongst a lot of other things, <laughs> but um, one of the things that you can spend um, some of those funds on is digital inclusion and broadband. We have several blog posts on our website that delve into those things. Um, those funds were made available to states and local governments earlier this year around May. Um, your local government or state likely already has those funds and uh, that they've already been allocated from the Treasury Department and they're likely in the process of trying to figure out how to spend them. So if you haven't already connected with your local government about using those funds and state government towards digital inclusion, I'd encourage you to do that. The next fund is the Capital Projects Fund, um, which is was released under the ARPA bill. However, we just got the guidelines for that two weeks ago. It's a $10 billion fund and it can be used for digital inclusion. We're also hosting, um, it's a little complicated on how to access the funds. We do have a blog post but um, to answer all your questions that you might have around this, we're hosting a webinar on the 21st with the Treasury Department. So please come and um, uh, ask all your questions to the folks at Treasury that you might have around this fund. Um, we'll send out the invitation shortly if you're on our listserv and if you're not, you should get on it and someone will tell you a little bit later about how to join. The next um, big fund is the Consolidated Appropriations Act. This was 1.5 billion. And within this, there were three funds that all went to, um, are being um, granted out through the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is the US, under US Department of Commerce. There's a broadband infrastructure program, a tribal connectivity fund, broadband expansion to underserved communities. And all of these can be used for broadband expansion itself. So the pipes and wires that Paula talked about earlier, um, but also the tribal and um, tribal fund and then the broadband expansion to underserved communities fund, which is funds that go to um, minority serving institutions such as HBCUs, um, they can be used for digital inclusion purposes. So I encourage you to go to um, NTIA's website, look at these funds and figure out how they might be leveraged in your community. So the infrastructure bill, if you've been paying attention to the news at all, you know that this is still pending. <laughs> it was passed by the Senate in 
August, I think it was. Um, but we're still waiting on the house to take it up. Um, at this point, the new deadline is the end of October and we'll see if that happens. Um, and if it is, it, uh, what it looks like right now is that the house will take this up at the same time as the reconciliation bill that they're working on. So within the infrastructure bill, the good news is, is that there's 65 billion set aside for broadband. And that's broken down into several different buckets. What we're most excited about here at NDIA is the Digital Equity Act, which is included in the bill. It's 2.75 billion for three types of programs. Um, one for states to create state broad, uh, digital equity plans. One for states then to, once they've created those plans, to implement those plans. And then another fund for, that's a competitive grant program for organizations like you. So anyone across the country doing digital inclusion work would be able to apply for that bucket of funds. Next up, there are funds for broadband deployment. Um, those will be state block grants to states. Um, there, the affordable connectivity program, that's um, the carry on or the next, next phase of the emergency broadband benefit program. And of significance here, $14.2 billion is a lot more than 3.2 billion. So we've got a big increase there, which would be really exciting. Um, next up is the tribal connectivity program. There's another billion for that. As you noticed, it was in the previous slide as well. So this is carrying that on. There's another uh, billion for middle mile connectivity. And then there is a section that outlines anti-digital discrimination. So, which is just another word that they used for digital redlining, that term that Angela went over at the beginning of the presentation. So the infrastructure bill addresses that directly, which we're excited about. So we don't know where things will end up, but should the infrastructure bill pass as it stands, this is what would be included. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to you, Muni Ray. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Um, so friends, uh, we are close to the end and we're gonna open for questions. But before we do that, we want to make sure you know how to engage and keep this relationship going and, and growing our partnership with you guys. So um, I'm going to pass it on to Yvette. We're going to talk more about how to join us. Hi, everyone. And I'd like to commend my colleagues because we've had like zero people drop off. So everyone's been here for this whole webinar, which I think is a first maybe for webinars. Um, glad you're all still here. That means you probably want to join us. Um, you can join as a friend affiliate or subscriber uh, joining NDIA as a friend or affiliate is free. You'll get access to our listserv, which some of my colleagues mentioned, which is really rich with resources and community and connections. Um, it's basically a place to ask your digital inclusion questions from folks who have been working, you know, from, from the ground up for, for years or for months or for various amounts of times, but it's a place to learn from each other. So we highly encourage you to do that. Um, if Caitlin, if you can drop a link, if you haven't, it's digitalinclusion.org slash join. Um, I also if, encourage you to join as a subscriber, which has a small cost, um, but if you're working in digital inclusion regularly, uh, I highly encourage it. You'll get special benefits to subscribing, including uh, small monthly calls with our executive director, Angela Seifer, and um, other benefits to um, being in the NDIA community. Um, and next slide, just a reminder, it is Digital Inclusion Week, which happens only once a year. Uh, it's the biggest by far that we've had in six years of doing Digital Inclusion Week. We have a hundred events registered. Those are not NDIA sponsored. Those are from our affiliates across the country. Some of those you can participate in in person and others are virtual. So please have a look at our um, Digital Inclusion Week webpage there to check them out. There's also a few that I've highlighted for the rest of the week. You can find these on our Digital Inclusion Week blog. There'll be links to, to each of these so you can check those out um, in the next 
couple of days. And lastly, I'd really like you to participate on social media. Digital Inclusion Week is a huge social media campaign. Um, I don't have a count, but I know there's been probably thousands of tweets coming through <laughs> that I've seen alone. So please um, tweet. Um, tell, tell us about something you've learned today in this webinar. Use the hashtag digital inclusion or DIW 2021 and hashtag digital equity now. Um, and a last challenge for you, you'll see a billboard there, which happens to be in Times Square, um, which is really exciting for us this year. That's sponsored by HP. Um, so we have billboards actually in nine cities in Chicago, Dallas, uh, New York, Baltimore, El Paso, LA, Miami, Orlando, and San Francisco. If you spot one of these billboards, please tweet it out or put it on Facebook or shoot me an email um, and take a selfie with that billboard and let us know that you spotted digital inclusion right there in your city. Um, and we'll send you a piece of swag as well if, you, if you're the first one from the city to do that. So I think that is all for Digital Inclusion Week and I'll send it back to Muni Ray. Yay, thank you, Vet. I, I am definitely interested in getting some swag, so I'll drive around <laughs> the country to get to get that picture. Um, but thank you, friends. Um, so if we stop sharing now, and this is, we have a little over 10 minutes to, to go through some of your questions. And we really, if you feel comfortable, we invite you to, you know, open your camera and let's talk and get to know each other. Um, see if there's any questions, anybody wants to ask a question um, right now. Yeah, you feel free to just unmute yourself for right now or put the question in the chat. I see a question from Lizette, um, I think for Amy, under the infrastructure bill, is it true that all states will get $100 million? For deployment of, of broadband to unserved areas, yes. So it, within that $42.5 billion section that is for de broadband deployment, um, yes, each state will get a minimum of $100 million, and then the rest of the funds will be um, split up amongst the states to, dependent upon how many unserved areas the states have. Any other questions to our team? Munire, um, will these slides be publicly available after this call ends? Yes, we'll uh, follow up and send you guys uh, the presentation. So if, so is any, I guess, if you guys have any questions, just jump in, but I would like to ask you guys, what are some of the efforts that you've seen in your community and, and some of the efforts that you are maybe trying to get started in your community and um, or things that you are most excited about in digital inclusion world. And if somebody doesn't share, I'll be. This is Diane okay. uh, from Ohio State University. I'm willing to jump in. I'll save you. <laughs> Thank um, you so much. <laughs> so I attended this webinar because I participate in a United Way program here in Central Ohio. It's called Women United, and we um, pull our donations together to fund this Empower, Educate, and Elevate program called E3 for women to who are just in a position of having to um, get some additional post-secondary training to be able to get a job with a livable wage, um, and hopefully something more than that, you know, a career. Long story short. These women go through, they work in cohorts, two cohorts a year, and they go through a boot camp program. And this boot camp's like 16 weeks. And as part of it, they get a device, they get a computer. And one of the things that I've learned, I mean, at the university, we are accustomed to buying computers by like the pallet full for computer lab refreshes and employee rollouts and so forth. And it was interesting trying to buy quantities of like 15 or 20 that are decent laptops for these ladies um, 
And what I learned in the process is how splintered the procurement process is for end user devices um, when you get outside of like corporate procurement models. I'm wondering, I mean, I haven't yet, I'm now starting to plow through your links and resources and so forth, but how have you all like pooled dollars together to be able to, to work with companies like Gov Connection, CDW, you know, the big suppliers of devices um, to be able to get good devices for our constituents at a decent price? That's a great question. Um, and I see that um, Jessica has actually asked a similar question from Austin Freenet. Um, her question was also related to some of our biggest challenges and um, in regarding funding for digital inclusion work. So Angela, you wanna take that? Yeah, sure. So I'm gonna offer two suggestions. One is Digitunity is a national partner that really focused on devices. So um, Miles, would you stick the Digitunity link in there, please? And then also, so I live in Columbus, Ohio, and Franklin County has a digital inclusion coalition. And one of the working groups is focused on devices. So it's gathering those. Are you on that working group? Am I telling you things right now? Um, so what we've seen in other cities is the gathering together to do those bigger bulk purchases by being able to attach them. What one of our other affiliates has done is had a corporate partner and then that corporate partner attached the request for the devices into their own request for devices. So then it was part of a much bigger order going out. So I think you're on the right path of figuring out those kinds of strategies. I'm curious if others on the call have solved this problem. I think that's definitely one reason why you should join the community so we can continue this conversation because there's definitely a, a willingness to share and learn from each other. And it's um, and NDIA is really happy to provide this platform um, as we continue. Um, I, before- I offer, Mini Ray, can I offer one more yeah. thought? Diane, I would encourage you to post to the listserv and say, okay, I know of these strategies, what else are folks doing, right? Like get, encourage them to get out of the things we always say, right? And the things that, that folks know are strategies just as we did today, right? Like we get stuck. We're like, this is how much we know. What else do we know? Um, so I would ask, cause I think it means something if that comes from you, you're like, we're trying to solve this problem. Who else has come up with some creative solutions and see what you get back. Yes, I also um, going to, to the chat and if you guys see anything else, let me know. Um, Tim, about uh, your question in regard to the, the metrics for the um, redlining report. I think Yvette has posted link there for, um, for that report. And, and that's the report we, um, we did for uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm trying to look for any other question, guys. Um, and yeah, and do you see any other questions? Or we still have a couple more minutes if anybody has um, anything they want to share or ask any questions. Yeah, I think Heather asked what, uh, how you determine what is an unserved area um, in regards to deployment grants. Um, every every federal program at this point defines that differently. Um, but the infrastructure bill defines that as areas that have um, less than 25 megabits download, three megabits upload. So that would be um, unserved areas. They also have a definition for underserved areas, which are areas that are, have less than 100 megabits down, 20 megabits upload. And if you don't know what any of that means, don't worry. <laughs> There's lots of resources on our website or feel free to send me a note and we, I can help talk you through what that means. Yes, and um, Diane, um, your question um, on if the webinar is recorded, yes, it's recorded and it will be made available. Um, Yvette, how's it exactly? I, people can find the recording. I will include it on our blog um, after Digital Inclusion Week as a, a resource for everyone. Okay, great, thank you.
Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, I'll just share real briefly about what I've seen in New York City. So New York City Housing, NYSHA, has partnered with the Department of Aging to give out devices to senior citizens. That is a program that they activated. Um, so, you know, most of the seniors, they're taking care of their grandkids and so they could do the work. And one other thing, which I dropped in the chat is an organization called the Point CDC. They've actually built some, uh, like a network on buildings with nodes. It was like a tech, um, a technological endeavor where the community created their own network. And so I dropped the link in the, it's in the chat somewhere. It's called the Point CDC. So I definitely encourage individuals to, you know, take a look at the work that they're doing and taking their power back. Awesome. Thank you, Beverly. All right. Well, friends, we have one more minute. If anybody have any burning questions or and want to share anything in the last few seconds. Well, um, it seems so. Um, so if not, thank you guys so much for joining us. I know there was a lot of resources and uh, it was, was really content heavy, but we're really happy to have you here and hope you come back and hope you to see your faces and other community calls. And please um, reach out to us, engage and, um, and ask any questions. And we're here to, to really support you and the work you're doing in the community. So, Keep your eyes out for the presentation and maybe even the link for the uh, recorded session. That's it. Thank you guys. Have a good one.